Good morning, church. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song called Build Your Kingdom Here. If you don't know it, just clap along. You'll find a beat. Come set rain in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
sing this together. Sing out. I know you know this. All right, let's sing it. In Christ the Lord, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seems, my comfort, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, my faith, in Christ alone, through truth on faith. you for going to our cross that was meant for us that punishment that you went through those nails in your hands and feet the crown of thorns in your head the lashing the cat of nine tails on your back all that was for my sin and Lord for us to have no guilt in life no fear in death that's only something that you could give Lord God you're here with us I, I, I can really sense your presence with us this morning Lord and I pray that Lord we just please you with the response to the truth of the word of God as it's preached in a moment as we continue in worship Lord let us glorify your name we love you with all our hearts it's in your name we pray amen thank you church you can be seated <laughs> I was lost, I 
was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you pay the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the
This morning. I'm already glad we came to church. So this morning we have a very special guest with us, Pastor Johnny Crane from West Virginia. And I promised him this morning I would get up here and introduce him as a very amazing, dashingly handsome young man. But uh, I can't lie at church, so I'm sorry, Pastor Johnny. But um, no, I'm kidding. Pastor Johnny's been with us several times before. We love him to have him. He's always a blessing. He has a lot to teach us because he's been in the ministry for a long time, ever since he was a teenager. So I ask you, please, let's open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what he has for us from God's word this morning. And we would love to hear what you have. Pastor Johnny, thank you, sir. All right. 
John 14, please. John chapter 14. And I have been here uh, a few times. Uh, I was thinking back yesterday, I think I mentioned the first time I preached here was in 2012. So you turn and you stand there and we'll read God's word together. John chapter 14. And me and my wife and family were here uh, just two years ago. And I only brought one of my children with me. We have four, but I have one. Uh, his name's Cohen or Coco. He's in junior church right now. And I'm sure he's having a great time. Uh, probably having a better time than you're about to have. You get stuck with me. And they've got candy probably over there. And uh, I don't have candy or gold stars to put by your name. Uh, we have the Word of God to look into today. So let's go ahead and read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 together, please. The Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity to be at Sunview Baptist this morning. It's been amazing to see throughout the years what you've done through and uh, for this church. But I pray this morning that as we are gathered here today in your name, as your name has already been lifted up, it's already been glorified in the songs that we've sung and the songs that we've heard. But I pray this morning that you will help comfort our hearts today. As you are there in this upper room comforting your disciples, telling them that you may leave for a while, but you are going to bring them where you are. This morning, we're still holding on to that great promise today. We have never seen you with our eyes, but we know word today that you are preparing a special place for us and that one day we are going to be with you forever. I pray that you'll help us as we learn from you this morning. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Where we're at in scripture this morning is here really in the last couple chapters of John, John chapter 13 all the way through chapter 16. Uh, you have uh, the, 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 a lot of scripture is given to this last night of Jesus with his disciples. And here Jesus is in the upper room, but just a few days prior, Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He has uh, had thousands of people praise his name. He has been teaching in the temple. He has seen a lot, but Judas has just been dismissed. And Jesus is troubled. The disciples are troubled. He tells them that he is leaving. And this isn't just the first time Jesus has ever told them that. All throughout his ministry on earth, he told his disciples that one day he was going to leave. One day he would die. He knew what his future was. But his disciples had really bought into the same theology of the, of the day that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to establish an earthly kingdom. He was going to come and he was going to remove the shackles of Rome and he was going to come and, and they were going to be able to be lieutenants in his army. They're even arguing in Luke 22. It tells us that they were uh, dis, uh, discussing who was going to be at the right hand. Who is going to be his number one person in the kingdom? And Jesus, as he's listening, as he's hearing this, he removes himself from his honored position at the front of the table to then place a servant's apron on, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. The one that had sat at the right hand of the Father from, for all eternity and will one day rule and reign over everything has humbled himself to the lowliest position. He took on the form of a servant. Well, why did he do that? He did that to, to minister to us. 
We read the verse just a few moments ago in, in Sunday school, uh, but it said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come to lay a list of demands on you or I, but he came to seek and to save. Jesus Christ came to minister to our greatest need. He came to bring salvation to us. That's what he's showing his disciples. And in John 13, verse 12, he'd washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again. And he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He's resumed his position. He is going to one day resume his position of, uh, of sitting. He's not one day. He's already there in the throne and beside the throne. And one day the Bible says in Philippians that every knee will bow and every tongue confess of who he is. God is going to highly exalt him. But in verse 21 of John 13, if you just hold your Bible open in John 13 as we work our way, uh, and we're going to show you where, what's happening there in this room. Jesus, in verse 21, it says that when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Everyone there in the room, they didn't know who he was speaking of. Jesus does. And, and we know the day who he was speaking of. But those disciples that had been traveling with him for years that have heard him teach, that had been poured into, are all looking around, and they're not just assuming that others could be the one. They're thinking that, is it me? Am I going to be the one to betray the Savior? No one assumed it was Judas as Judas leaves. No one thought that's why he left. They thought he was going to do some work. But in verse number 33 of John 13, it says, Little children, yet a little while, while I am with you, ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. He said, I'm, I'm going to leave you. You're going to seek for me, but I'm not going to be in your midst anymore. Verse 36, they said, Where, what do you mean you're leaving? Where are you going? He says, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. We talked about yesterday to the men. Peter says, hey, uh, Jesus, you, you're saying you're leaving. We're not coming. I'm following you. I'm going to lay down my life so that you don't have to. He's very heroic. Nothing is going to stop me, Jesus, from following you. Peter is the hero in his own story. Sounds like a lot of us. That's what we do. We see ourselves as better than everyone else. And he believes in himself. And you can count on me to rise to the occasion, Jesus. But we know that Jesus, he says, Peter, that's not what's going to happen. You're going to deny me. And even before the rooster in the morning crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter doesn't believe it. Someone they trust is, is going to fail them. Someone they trust is going to forsake them. We know that's Judas. And the leader in their midst, as Peter is, is going to deny him. They can't even trust themselves. They can't trust each other. They're perplexed. They're scared. They're afraid of what the future holds. And Jesus, even though he's troubled, he is going to try to bring comfort to the disciples. And I think the words that he shared that we read earlier, the words of comfort of John 14, 1 through 6, is a word of comfort for us today. We live in a world, and, and, and in our world is very distressing times. It's very dark, and it's getting darker and darker. And yet even in the midst of all that we're seeing happening on earth today, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. But God, my heart is troubled. My heart is troubled about the future for my children and my family. The heart, my, my, my heart is troubled because of my own personal future, of uh, uh, financial security. My heart is troubled about what is happening all around the world today, the wars and, and rumors of war, war, wars, and there's, there's earthquakes, there's pestilences, and it's exactly how Christ described the earth to be. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my heart is troubled. 
My heart is overwhelmed at looking and, and hearing people and, and the way they have just rejected God. And they mock and, and ridicule His Word and what He's done. And they blatantly say they don't need God. They don't need Jesus. And I think in verse number 1 we see something that was significant to the disciples and significant for us this morning is that number one, we have a Savior we can depend on. We have a Savior that we can depend on. Let's read verse 1 again. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me. Believe also, uh, you believe in God. Believe also in me. The hidden sins of others, Judas, the hidden sins of our own heart and Peter, and we can find ourselves sometimes waiting in unbelief. He's saying, don't do that. You believe in God, a God that you've never seen, and a God that even though you've never seen, you've been willing to follow me for three years. Believe also in me. In verses 1 through 14, we see the word believe six times. Jesus is speaking to the disciples as a group here. He says, let not your hearts... They didn't know that Judas had left to betray. They imagined that maybe and possibly the betrayer was still there in their midst. They were troubled. Jesus has said he's leaving. What are we to do if we can't trust ourselves or trust each other? How does Jesus lead them forward with those thoughts? Jesus, does he say, hey, you know what? The betrayer is gone. He was the bad apple. Now you can trust one another. No, that's not what he says. Hey, the, the, the betrayer is gone, and that means that the rest of you are chosen, and you believe you can now believe in yourself. No, that's not what he says. He looks to them, and in that group, and the only way forward, he says, every single one of you must believe, you must trust in me. The answer to broken trust isn't to give up trusting. The answer to our troubled hearts this morning is to say, you know what, I'm just done believing in anything. The answer to, uh, the, to the perplexities of our heart is not to say, you know what, I, I'm just going to trust myself and myself alone. No. The trust or the answer this morning is to trust in Jesus. And that's what the church is meant to be. It's not about gathering around a leader, an individual. No, it's a community of people that have come together who trust in Jesus Christ. And when others disappoint you, we trust in Jesus. When you disappoint yourself, you trust in Jesus. We have to believe in who he is. So instead of giving in to a troubled heart, Jesus told them to firmly place their trust in God and who he is. God is a very radical call to trust in Jesus. Just as one would trust in God the Father, and a radical promise that doing so would bring comfort and peace to a troubled heart. Jesus' solution to a troubled heart, Jesus' solution to the perplexities of this life is not a recipe, but it is a relationship with him. This morning, if you maybe are new, I, I don't know. Some of you I have seen many times as I've come through. Some of you I've never met, and maybe some of you I met yesterday and I've already forgot who you were. I don't know exactly what you're facing today, but I know that if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, your heart can never find what it's searching for without believing in Him. The answer is not going to be coming to this church or giving money to an organization. The answer is not going to be doing enough good to outweigh all the bad. The answer is found in believing Jesus Christ, having a relationship with him. We see, number one, that he is a savior you can depend on. He says, believe in me. But number two, we have a promise that we can believe a promise that we can believe. Look at verse number two. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. What a great promise this morning. There is a Father's house. 
Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he was in the temple and he said, uh, my father's house should be called a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. He is not talking about the temple here. Jesus has already prophesied that one day that temple is going to be destroyed. And it was in 70 AD, it was completely destroyed. Jesus is not talking about that. In the book of Hebrews, uh, the Bible shows us that these things on earth that we see with our eyes and in the Old Testament, the temple, the, even the law, pattern of things in heaven. Even though he called the temple his father's house on this earth, he's not talking about the temple there. He is talking about what the temple was designed to, to look like. He is talking about the father's house in heaven. And he says, there is a house there is my father's house. And Jesus doesn't tell them he's going to make the world a better place. He doesn't tell them that he is going to cause all the problems to stop, that life is just going to become good. He doesn't even say that you're going to get to be a part of a church, and in that church there's not going to be any problems. Maybe at Sunview there's no problems. At Faith Baptist there's problems because I work there. He doesn't say that the answer to our life is going to be found here on this earth. He says the answer to, to the problems and perplexities of life is believing in me and placing hope and a future to come. Placing hope and knowing that one day we also will be in the Father's house. It's not a hope that one day the world will get better or that people will stop betraying you, or that we'll even stop betraying ourselves, or that a church will be perfect. No, the hope for the troubled heart is that one day we will be with Christ in his Father's house. And that is a promise that we can believe. And heaven is, is beyond our imagination. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We've never seen anything like it. There's not been a movie made that has uh, graphics and computer animation that, that shows you anything close to what heaven looks like. And it's a place filled with people. Revelation 7 says there's a great multitude. But Jesus describes heaven here in verse number 2 he describes it as home. You know, the home today is much different than what it used to be. The home used to be a place of comfort. Now, today, it's more like a boarding house. We kind of come in, we eat, we sleep, and we leave. I have uh, four kids, and they play sports, and uh, they're in Taekwondo, they're in school, they're singing, they're doing church. I mean, we, we, we spend less time at home, I think, than almost anywhere else. Anybody else's life like that? But there's something about that word home. One of the strongest, uh, uh, one of the strongest parts of our memory is, is smell. Today, I, I can still smell, I can remember the smell of home. Most of the time, I remember because my mom was making brownies. Man, I love brownies. I think, I think I could smell brownies from like a two-mile radius when my mom was making them. But I could smell, I walk into my parents' house and all these memories flood back. I've been gone for a few days, and as I get home tonight, I'm going to smell, and I, I just flooded with, hey, this is where, what? This is where I belong. This is where the people are that I love. This is where my wife is. This is where my children are. This is where they feel secure. This is where they feel safe. But the Father's house is going to be better than, than any home here on earth and we'll feel more at home in heaven one day than any place you could go today that as a believer is where I belong I'm just a, a pilgrim passing through I don't belong to earth anymore and one day even though I have not seen it even though I can't comprehend it one day Christ is going to bring me home isn't that a great promise this morning our hearts are troubled. The disciples' hearts are troubled. He says, but you know what? You have a Savior you can depend on. Their hearts are troubled. He says, let me give you a promise, a promise that you can rely on, that you can believe that in my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, and you're going to live with me. Back then, 
uh, as a family got married, a couple, a young couple were married, they would build an extension on to their, uh, the husband's father's house. As a family, they had many kids back then. Why? Because uh, a lot of reasons, but they needed workers in the field, and, and they would have children, and they would stay, and they would work, and they had uh, all of these children as they got married. The father's house became this big, giant mansion filled with many rooms. You know, I know we have a lot of ideas about what heaven's going to be. Maybe you think, you know, I'm going to have a map to know exactly where Jonah's house is and Peter's house is, and I'm going to go and I'm going to visit them. Can I tell you, there's, there's no map in heaven. It's all the Father's house. We're going to all be living together with our Father. And you say, well, I don't know if that sounds very good. I think it's because we don't understand what that means. I will be at home I will be with my God forever. And he says that, number three, I'm going to make preparation. We see this preparation by Jesus. He says, I go to prepare a place for you in verse number three. Love prepares a welcome. With love, parents of a first child is going to make that nursery special. Remember painting, I think we painted the room, it was some kind of purple. My wife could tell you the name of the paint. I can't. Some pinkish purplish for our oldest, which turns 11 this year. And we brought her home, and she still has that blanket that we brought her home in. She still has some stuffed animals that I bought her as an excited dad 11 years ago. We made a place for her. Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. Why? Because I love you. And I'm confident that you will arrive. I'm not going to mislead you. I'm preparing this place for you. And he says, I'm going there, and I will prepare this place. And it's not like Jesus is working nonstop. Uh, Jesus was there at creation, and God created all that we see, life itself. He created it instantly with a word. Jesus isn't needing these 2,000 years to prepare this place for us. No, let's look at verse number three again. He says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive into myself that where I am, there ye may be also. This going here is speaking of Jesus' planning and his initiative. Through his going, the place will be prepared. Well, where is he going? He's going to the cross. Just a few hours, he is going to stand trial. He's going to be found guilty to the Sanhedrin. He's going to stand before Gentiles. He's going to be mocked, and he's going to be persecuted, and he is going to be tormented. And he's going to carry his cross outside of town to the hill of Golgotha, and he's going to be placed on that cross to suffer the wrath of God as all the sins of mine and yours are placed upon him. And he says, I am going to the cross. I am going to prepare a place for you. And by my going to die for you, a place is prepared for you. He opens the door for all who believe to enjoy the Father's house. Jesus wasn't taken to the cross. He went there. Like a lamb dumb before his shears, he laid down his life for us. What was he doing? At that cross, he was preparing a place. He was preparing the way for us to go to the Father's house. They thought that his death was this accident or calamity. It's just, I can't believe this happened. They're troubled. He says he's going to leave, and he's saying, no, 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 I have come. I am going to the cross so that you can come and be with me. The disciples don't quite understand. Even Peter said, hey, no, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to die for you. He promised more than he was able to deliver. But you know, if heaven depended on what we did for Christ, our hearts this morning would always be troubled. If heaven and me getting there depended on my righteousness or my good things and good deeds and my treatment of others... If heaven depended on me, I would find no comfort. My heart would be permanently in disarray. It would ultimately lead to my destruction. 
Heaven is prepared for us by what he is going to do, where he was going to the cross. This leads us to number four as a future hope and comfort. He said, I prepare a place for you in verse number three. That's to every believer. He's gone to the cross for you this morning. He guarantees that he will come again. And he will take you with him. And where he is, we will be with him. And that is why we can be certain. If he went to the cross, which he did, if he died, which he did, he resurrected, which we celebrated a few weeks ago, we know that we can be and will be with him for those that believe in him. What a comfort that is for me this morning. To know that even though this world is filled with trials and difficulties, I have comfort. I have hope. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. He promised to come again for his disciples. Now, I, I, I have studied uh, the end times and revelation. I just, uh, I'm in the middle of some studies in a class right now, and I, I, a few, uh, two semesters ago, I took a class on the book of Revelation now than I did before. I think all I've learned is that none of us know exactly what the end looks like. Just like the Sanhedrin and the Jewish people didn't know what the Messiah coming would look like. But I do know this, and he makes this promise here. He says, I am going to come again for you. Some of us may go by the way of death and be in his house forever that way, and I believe some of us will be taken with him. But you know, the entire New Testament church, they, th that generation, they, they believed that promise. Even Paul, as he wrote to the Thessalonians, he says, so shall you ever be with the Lord. He says, you're going to be with me. I'm going to meet you in the air. There's hope in those words that where I am, ye may be also. You know, the entire focus of heaven isn't on the mansions. It isn't, it, it isn't on the street of gold. It isn't on any of that. The, the focus of heaven here is to be united with Christ. And I can take comfort in knowing that even as he prepares and has gone to this place for us, he is preparing us for that place. Jesus settled his heart on the day of victory. While even in verse 21 of 13, it says that his heart is troubled. He knows what the cross is ultimately going to be. That's why he says that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. And that's applicable to us. How do we endure the betrayal of someone like Judas that's near to us? How do we endure the affliction that we bring upon ourselves like Peter? Our hope is found in the future. That where he is, that's where I'm going to be. It's our hope, our expectation, our focus. And that leads us to verse 4. He says, and whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, but Jesus, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? In verse number 6, he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus didn't say that he was going to show us a way. He said, I am the way. He didn't promise to teach us a truth. He said, I am the truth. Jesus didn't offer us all the secrets to life. He said, I am the life. I'm the only way. That's what he said. Jesus' way would be the cross. He would be convicted his body would lie in a, a lifeless tomb. But because he took that way, he is the way to the Father's house. Because he endured the cross, we can rest assured and have comfort this morning that where he is, we're not going to remain here. We're not going to remain buried underneath the earth. No, where he is, one day I will be because he went the way of the cross for me. Because of our belief in him. Jesus said that it's not that there are many ways that get there. No, he says, I am the only way. Jesus is the exclusive way. There is an absolute truth. The gospel. 
We need help. We can't do it on our own. We are sinners. We have transgressed God's law. And our destination without Christ is not the Father's house. But his love for us was proven on the cross. And he rose again the third day, defeating both sin and death. And now, this morning, we can have life. Not just eternal life in the Father's house. I believe that there is an abundant life even for us here through the power of Jesus Christ. And as we reflect on these truths that we've looked at today, we've seen how Christ, amidst the turmoil and betrayal and uncertainty, he offers himself as the ultimate source of trust and hope. His love and his sacrifice, it knows no bounds, and he is actively preparing a place for us in the Father's house. For you this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've been saved We need to anchor our life in this truth and build our faith and fortify your resolve that, hey, you know, it might be troubled in the world, but my heart is not troubled this morning. Because where Jesus is, because of the way that he went, one day I will be with him. In times of broken trust and despair, cling to Jesus. He is our rock upon which we stand and we can build our trust upon. And the promise of heaven brings comfort to our hearts. Yes, to see those that have gone on before, but more than that is to be united with Christ, to be reunited in the Father's home. Maybe there's some you're still seeking. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I urge you to, today to consider and understand that Christ is the only way to the Father's house. You'll not find salvation. You'll not find comfort any other way. In a world that's filled with competing voices and ideologies and philosophies and religions, Jesus says, I am the way, meaning I am the only way. I am the truth, the only truth. I am the life, the only life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. If you've not met Jesus Christ this morning, he went to the cross to die for your sins. He went to the cross that even though you're a sinner, he wanted to prove and to demonstrate his love for you. He's made a way for you to the Father's house, but it's only through him. Whether you're saved this morning or you're still finding and seeking after salvation, May you find peace and comfort in the unchanging person of Jesus Christ. He's the answer to our deepest longing. He's the hope for our troubled hearts. And he's the promise of a glorious future beyond anything we can believe or comprehend today. He says, I know you're upset. I know your hearts are troubled. Believe in me. I'm going the way of the cross to prepare the way for you, the only way to the Father's house. That where I am, there you may be also. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to start with a word of prayer this morning. And even after that prayer, I'm going to ask just two questions for us.